We have two stories in this one video that will teach us all about alpha thalassemia. Normally, we have a total of four alpha globin genes on chromosomes 16. In alpha thalassemia, you're missing any number of these genes. It could be one, two, three, or all four. We will meet some adult children and later a baby who were all discovered to have hemoglobin H disease where they were each missing three of their four alpha globin genes. Let's start with the first story and head back to 1955. A trio of brilliant doctors from Portland, Oregon discovered hemoglobin H disease in a Chinese family. Their original paper stated that this Chinese family and their ancestors were originally from Canton, China. But as many people have educated me on TikTok, this area is now known as Guangzhou. This family had three very sick children. These kids were in and out of the hospital. They had jaundice, which is when the whites of their eyes had this yellowish tinge to them. They were constantly fatigued. This was interrupting their childhood and their schooling. And they were all told at some point they were anemic, but that was it. At the time of the study, they were now adults between the ages of 24 and 30. Our trio of doctors, doctors Dimitrios Rigas, Robert Kohler, and Edwin Osgood, not only studied these three now adult children, but their entire family to get the answer. And this was a big family, and it became our first discovery of a type of alpha thalassemia. The two parents had eight children in total, but only six living at the time. Unfortunately, they had two children, a boy and a girl, who died in infancy. The three doctors made a pedigree of the entire family. They studied the parents and the living children, their symptoms and how they were doing in life, and whenever possible, they examined their blood to check for certain things and also to look at their blood under the microscope. And so we will do the same here, but instead of just looking at laboratory numbers, we will also look at these cells and what I think they would look like in 3D. Here is our pedigree with our two parents at the top and the six living children at the bottom. We will study each person on this pedigree. We will check their blood, specifically their hemoglobin levels, and then take a closer look at their red blood cells in 3D. We will look at their hemoglobin in two ways. The first is their hemoglobin level, which is something we do today in the laboratory. If we drew some blood with all the red blood cells in it, popped those red blood cells and measured how much hemoglobin is inside this entire tube of blood, we would get an amount. And that amount is in grams per deciliter. One deciliter is 100 milliliters, or roughly the equivalent of three espresso shots. I like to think of commonplace equivalents, and I love coffee, and espresso is my favorite. So we're measuring how many grams of hemoglobin there is inside of three espresso shots worth of blood. Now every lab has their own ranges of what is normal on the tests that they do. For a man, it's about 13.5 to 17.5 grams per deciliter, and for women, it's 12 to 15. But we will keep it simple for our study. We're just gonna remember our threshold. That's 12 for women and 14 for men. The second way we will look at hemoglobin is how much hemoglobin is inside of a red blood cell. There are hundreds of millions of hemoglobin molecules inside a single red blood cell. Hemoglobin is what makes red blood cells red, and because of the red blood cell shape being this biconcave disc, that center is thinner. So if we look at it here, there is less hemoglobin in the center because there's less space for the hemoglobin to take up here. And because of that, the center part looks a little bit paler with less hemoglobin there. This is known as the central pallor. And normally that central pallor only takes up about a third of the red blood cell. We can calculate the hemoglobin amount per red blood cell. This is called the mean corpuscular hemoglobin or MCH. So instead of counting hundreds of millions of molecules of hemoglobin, we now have that measurement in picograms, which is one trillionth of a gram. A normal MCH is 27 to 32 picograms. To get that MCH, we take our hemoglobin, the one in grams per deciliter, and divide it by the red blood cell count and multiply it by 10. I talked about this red blood cell count in my last video. If you want to check it out, it's linked here. In their paper, our trio gave us the hemoglobin and the red blood cell count. All of the red blood cell counts were in the normal range, so I thought we should use the MCH. 
and then take a look at the MCH in 3D when we look at each family member. And don't worry, I already did all this math for you, and this MCH will be the last number you'll need to think about, and that threshold is 27. So we have 12 and 14 for hemoglobin to remember, and 27 for the MCH. And lastly, let me show you what a normal red blood cell filled with a normal amount of hemoglobin looks like. This is your reference here. All of the red blood cells are disc-shaped, filled with hemoglobin, but with that paler central area where that red blood cell is thinner. Let's go to the pedigree. We will start at the top with mom and dad. Mom reported feeling fine throughout her entire life with good health. She had a hemoglobin of around 12 and an MCH of 26. So her hemoglobin here is normal, but her MCH is just a touch lower than normal. When we have some red blood cell lab values that are a bit lower, we think of anemia. Anemia comes from the Greek word meaning lack of blood, but I like to think of anemia as having less of that red blood cell around in the blood. It describes anything that causes us to have less of those red corpuscles around that take up less space than normal in our blood. Corpuscle comes from the Latin word corpusculum, which means small body. So my definition of anemia is any condition where those little red bodies take up less space than normal in the blood. And this could be due to having less red blood cells around. We could have a lower number or a lower red blood cell count. We could have red blood cells that are smaller in size with a smaller MCV or mean corpuscular volume. Things that are smaller in size take up less space or we could have less hemoglobin around. Remember that a red blood cell is approximately 95% hemoglobin, so with less hemoglobin around, there is less of that red body around. And there are different types and causes of anemia. If we had to give mom here an anemia or describe it on a scale, I would give it a grade one because she just has that slightly low MCH but a normal hemoglobin. And here are what mom's red blood cells look like. The cells look slightly paler compared to normal. Now let's go to dad. Dad had been feeling fine throughout his entire life. He was found to have a hemoglobin of 12 and an MCH of 21. So both of his numbers are lower. He is anemic. He's a little bit more anemic than mom, so let's give him a grade two. And here are his red blood cells. They look a little bit paler in the center compared to normal. Now let's move on to the children, starting with daughter number one. Her blood was not available to be drawn for hemoglobin or red blood cell counts, but another test was later performed that was normal. More on that in a bit. So I will give her lab values that she likely had. Let's give her a hemoglobin of 15 and an MCH of 30, and here are her red blood cells, and everything's normal. Daughter number two, she was the only other person who we also don't have a hemoglobin or red blood cell count on. However, the doctors learned that she was getting liver and iron shots for being anemic. So I'm gonna give her a hemoglobin of 11 and an MCH of 22. Here are her red blood cells. They look pretty similar to what we saw in dad. So let's give her the same anemia. Let's give her a grade two. Next, we have our first son. He was reported to have a hemoglobin of 15 and an MCH of 23. He felt great throughout his entire life. His MCH is lower. It reminds us a bit of mom who had a lower MCH but a normal hemoglobin. So let's give him a grade one anemia and here are his cells. They look very similar to mom's. Next, let's move on to our three children who were sick throughout most of their lives. We have two sons and one daughter here. Their hemoglobins range from eight in the daughter to the 11s in the son, so it's very low. Their MCHs ranged from 16, 17, and then to 21. That's also low. These three kids were having the most severe anemia of the entire family, and under the microscope, they also had the most abnormal cells. Here is what they looked like. So the cells were very different in sizes and shape. Some of them were really small, some of them had these strange shapes making teardrops, and the cells looked paler than normal. If we had to grade this anemia, we would give them a grade three. So now the doctors had all their info, like we have right now, but they still didn't know what was causing the severe anemia in the three children. So they did two more experiments. First, they stained everybody's cells with this blue dye called Brilliant Creasel Blue. 
mom, dad, and the first three kids' cells showed nothing when they were stained with this dye. The dye didn't do anything. But as for the three adult children with the most severe anemia, their cells showed these little blue spots inside of the cells. These little spots had dimples within them. Some people call them golf balls. Other people call them blue raspberries. I made them look like blue raspberries here. So our brilliant trio saw this but didn't know what they were. The next thing they wanted to do was to check everybody's hemoglobins. And if you want a refresher on normal hemoglobins, please check out my last video. The hemoglobins you find in an adult are a mix of three different types of hemoglobins. There's mostly hemoglobin A, which is a quad of two yellow alpha globins and two orange beta globins. This is about 97% of the total adult hemoglobin you will find. There's a little bit of hemoglobin A2, which is two alphas and two blue deltas here. And then there's a teeny bit of hemoglobin F, which is two alphas and two purple gammas put together. All three of these hemoglobins are about the same size, but they differ in their charges. All of these hemoglobins are negative, but A is the most negative of the three, followed by F, and then A2 is the least negative. The doctors performed a type of test to separate out these hemoglobins and identify them inside of the red blood cells of each of the family members. This test is called hemoglobin electrophoresis and it's still performed today. Here is how it works. The doctors took a blood sample from most of the kids, all but one. To check the hemoglobin, they would have to pop their red blood cells and then take all that hemoglobin and load it onto this gel. This gel is a bit like Jell-O. I think about it as a firmer Jell-O. It has lots of teeny tiny microscopic holes throughout it. And there's also these larger rectangular spaces here on the left. Those are the wells, and that's where we're gonna load our samples of hemoglobin. The first thing you do is you take this gel and put it in a box with solution. Next, we load our samples in. For our first run of this experiment, we're gonna have mom and dad up at the top, and then the first three kids who had normal grade two and grade one anemias. Once loaded, these hemoglobins can start moving through these tiny little holes, but to get it moving, we need an electric current that takes us from negative near the wells to positive at the other side of the gel. The more negative the hemoglobin, the further it will move or the closer it will get to this positive node. The samples were loaded, the current was applied, and after some time, the trio of doctors came back to see how far the hemoglobins had moved across the gel. Let's look at these results. We first start with mom and dad at the top, and their hemoglobin separated out in a normal pattern. There is hemoglobin A here, closest to the positive node, followed by F, followed by A2. Next, we have our three kids, and their hemoglobin pattern looks exactly the same as mom and dad, which was normal. Now let's test the three children with the most severe anemia, and we'll use mom and dad as a control. I got a couple of comments on TikTok asking me where the control was, and I had already rendered out this gel to have five wells to work out perfectly for this family. So there was no control this time around. We have a control in our next story, but for now we will use mom and dad as our control. Mom and dad are the first two wells followed by the three children who had the most severe anemia. And here are the results. Now compared to mom and dad, they did have bands in A, F, and A2, but there was this brand new band that traveled past hemoglobin A. And this was a totally new hemoglobin that our trio discovered. They referenced hemoglobin C, D, E, and G in the beginning of their paper. So I think they went along with the alphabet and named this new hemoglobin with the next letter H. Our children with the severe anemia now had this new hemoglobin H. It comprised about 40% of their total hemoglobins and the disease that these kids had is now known as hemoglobin H disease, a type of alpha thalassemia. What is hemoglobin H? Our normal hemoglobins of A, A2, and F, they are heterotetramers, meaning they are two different pairs of globins put together. But H here is an abnormal homotetramer made up of just beta globins. 
Here is what was going on for our adult kids. Instead of having four functioning alpha globin genes, these kids were making hemoglobin H because they only had one functioning alpha globin gene, which means they made a lot less of alpha globin off this chromosome 16. But the genes on chromosome 11 were fine. They were making beta globins, they were making a touch of delta globins, and they were making a touch of gamma globins. The few alpha globin pairs that were around preferred to pair with the beta globins. So these kids were making some normal hemoglobin A, approximately 50 to 60%. And then a few gamma globin pairs did get paired up with a few alpha globin pairs, making our fetal hemoglobin. A couple of delta pairs did link up with some alpha globin pairs, but it was less than the normal amount, so it was less than 1%. But that left a lot of beta globin pairs alone and unpaired. And even though they prefer to pair up with a different type of globin, their priority is to make a quad. So even if it means making a quad with an identical pair of itself, it will do it. And that's what happened in this case. The beta globin pairs paired up, forming this quad of beta globins now known as hemoglobin H. And hemoglobin H causes a lot of problems. They only have one alpha globin gene working, so they're making less hemoglobin to begin with. Now this quad, this hemoglobin H, is a hoarder of oxygen. So it grabs oxygen, but it doesn't want to let it go. So it's no wonder that these children were fatigued and tired. They're making less hemoglobin than normal, and then 40% of their hemoglobin is this oxygen hoarder, so there's a lot less oxygen being delivered to the cells throughout their bodies. Now, those blue raspberries were actually hemoglobin H in the cells. These are called inclusions. They're also called H bodies. These are not Heinz bodies, though. These inclusions at first don't seem like they cause much damage because they start out being soluble. However, they are very, very unstable, and over time they precipitate. So I picture them like these crystals that can poke at and damage the red blood cell from the inside and then those damaged cells get picked up by the spleen and get removed from circulation, resulting in less red blood cells around in the blood. All of this results in a lower than normal hemoglobin. For men, it's usually a hemoglobin of nine to 13, and for women, it's about seven to 11. And the treatment is seeing a doctor regularly as well as genetic counseling. If the hemoglobin drops below a certain level, blood transfusions are given. Now, as bad as these hemoglobin H inclusions sound, they aren't as bad as those alpha aggregates in beta thalassemia that we've seen before. Those alpha aggregates are insoluble from the start. They start damaging the red blood cell or even destroying red blood cells, even beginning in the bone marrow as those red blood cells are being born. And these poke and damage red blood cells throughout their short lifespan in circulation. Hemoglobin levels for patients with beta thalassemia major is often less than seven grams per deciliter, which is much lower than that of hemoglobin H disease. Now, there is a tiny bit of something that would have been made in these kids, but not picked up on this test, and it would get discovered three years later. And this one is made up of four gamma globins. By the way, delta tetramers are not made by the body. This tetramer is named hemoglobin Bartz, named after the hospital in which it was discovered, St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London, England. It's 1958 and we have an anemic Greek baby girl who has just been admitted to St. Bart's Hospital. She's about four weeks old and her hemoglobin is 10 and her MCH is 25 and her red blood cells looked like this. Looks familiar, right? Doctors didn't know what was causing her anemia, so they decided to check what kinds of hemoglobin this baby was making. And the doctors also decided to check mom and dad as well. I made us another pedigree where we will examine mom, dad, and baby like we did with the Chinese family from before. Let's start with mom. Mom felt normal throughout her entire life, and she was found to have a hemoglobin of 11 and an MCH of 25. And here is what her cells looked like. They're definitely paler in the center and both her hemoglobin and MCH are lower. So let's give her a grade two. Let's move on to dad. Dad had good health throughout his entire life, he said. And he had a hemoglobin of 14 and an MCH of 27. And here is what his red blood cells would have looked like. And they looked normal. 
Next, the doctors performed hemoglobin electrophoresis, which we are all experts at right now. So we will load our four samples. The first well will contain our control, followed by mom, dad, and then baby in the last well. Our control will show us the normal hemoglobins plus our discovery from three years earlier with hemoglobin H. And we run the gel and here are our results. Mom and dad have a normal pattern of A, F, and A2. And here is baby's pattern. She was making A, she was making F, but she was also making this brand new hemoglobin that had never been seen before. This hemoglobin was named hemoglobin Bartz after the hospital. And as it turns out, she too had hemoglobin H disease, just like the three severely anemic kids we talked about earlier. So why the different tetramers? Keep in mind what type of hemoglobin a four week old baby would be making. Normally, the baby would be making mostly hemoglobin F with some hemoglobin A and then a teeny bit of A2. Now, in our Greek infant with hemoglobin H disease, she too is missing three alpha globin genes. So there are less alpha globins being made, but she's also making a lot of gamma and a lot of beta globins. Now, the few alpha globin pairs that are around, they prefer beta globins. So those will pair up with all of the available beta globins to make hemoglobin A. And that Greek infant did have about 40% hemoglobin A made. She did make some hemoglobin F because there was a decent amount of alpha globin pairs that paired up with gamma globin forming hemoglobin F, but not all the gamma globins were paired up. There were a lot of gamma globin pairs that were lonely, and just like the beta globins of hemoglobin H, they want to be part of a quad even if it means pairing up with themselves and so pairs of gamma globins got together form this homotetramer of hemoglobin Bartz and so this baby was making about 25 percent of hemoglobin Bartz. When the baby would grow up to be an adult which in hemoglobin terms is six months old she would switch over to make more beta globins now and then she would start making that hemoglobin H like the three adult children we previously talked about. As for the other anemias we have seen and the reason we graded them one and two, our Chinese mom and one of her children, the one that we gave a grade one anemia, and the dad of the Greek infant were missing one alpha globin gene, making them silent carriers. In the Greek dad's case, you couldn't even detect anything wrong with his blood or with his red blood cells. This is sometimes the case with silent carriers. Nothing's actually wrong and they don't even know they have it. Our Chinese father and one of his children, they both had grade two anemia, and then our Greek mom also had grade two anemia. They were all missing two genes, both on one chromosome. This made them have alpha thalassemia minor, which is also known as alpha thalassemia trait. And then our three adult children with our severe anemia plus our Greek infant had hemoglobin H disease where they were missing three alpha globin genes. And I got a question on TikTok asking me if it's possible to miss all the genes. Unfortunately, that can happen. So no alpha globin genes means no alpha globins being made. And so that baby in utero would be making tons of hemoglobin Bartz, which is also an oxygen hoarder. And unfortunately, this is incompatible with life. And this is called Hydrops Fatalis. If you like this video, please like it. I love comments. Please comment down below, especially if you have any ideas for future videos. Oftentimes the inspiration for these videos comes from your suggestions. A lot of people have requested hereditary spherocytosis to be next, and that will be in the next video. And that was all because everyone commented saying that they wanted to see that. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any videos. And the last part of this video, I do want to give some big thank yous. The first one is to my absolutely amazing fiance. Here he is building the computer that I do my 3D rendering on. So when I met him, I was using a computer that was just not up to speed and it wasn't powerful enough. And my fiance is an absolute genius. He helps me so much. He built me the fastest computer I've ever seen. And so because of this, I'm able to create all these renderings very quickly. And this video is honestly made possible because of him. And if he wasn't, a, <laughs> and honestly, if he wasn't in my life, none of these videos would exist. He is a huge part of what I do. And I just want to say thank you. And if you, 
And if you're watching, I can't wait to marry you this fall. <laughs> and then I wanted to dedicate this video to my baby girl, Sophie. Unfortunately, she passed last month and she was with me from medical school, through residency, through fellowships, through attending hood, through leaving hospital life and becoming an artist. And she was always there. And for a while, I was very, very much alone in life. And she was really all I had. And she was always there for me. And I miss her so much. Um, she's honestly a big reason as to why I made this leap to switch over to making online educational content. It's been a sad month without her. She would have been, she was almost 16 years old. And here is our other dog. This is Asuka, she's two years old. She is super wild and crazy and just funny and just such a sweetheart. Her and Sophie were sisters for a year and it was fun to watch them interact because Sophie was a little bit of this grumpy older woman and Asuka was a crazy puppy. I think there was a lot of love between them. Thank you for watching this video. I can't wait to see you at the next one.